Hi, everybody. Welcome to Watch Time Science Talk. Uh, this is the second week of our March Nitrogen is in the Air presentations. Uh, we have two presentations. I'll try to make mine pretty quick, where we're talking a little bit about air pollution tools. So hopefully last week, you've all spotted up and listened to your webinar recording about air pollution effects and what JNCC's historical work was. And those are available if you want to follow up on that. Um, EPR, Ecological Consultancy, talking to us a bit about a road scheme and how they were detecting, or maybe not detecting, and there's a spoiler alert there, um, air pollution effects along a road. Making the invisible visible uh, is a title for so many different things, but we thought we'd go with that title for this presentation as well. We'll talk a little bit of a refresher for those who didn't get to see the talk last week about air pollution effects on ecosystems, uh, the data and tools that we use for our air pollution work, and then a bit of a, a whiz bang tour of the air pollution information system, which JNCC helps coordinate on behalf of the UK conservation agencies. And then a, a little bit of a forward look about for data and tools anyway in JNCC's work. Um, one thing to really give you a bit of context, the air pollution cuts across so many different government policy areas and research areas, et cetera, whether that be the 40,000 deaths quoted figure that you get quite a lot for UK and human health all the way to effects on ecosystems, which we'll hear about in a little bit, our international commitments for reducing amounts of air pollution that we produce, but also for protecting our, our uh, environments. And then there's quite a few other aspects that we work on here in JNCC, whether that be um, aspects of farming and agriculture or how we, we assess the, the, the inherent value of nature and try to get that into our thinking. Just a quick reminder, so what you might have heard about in the last talks is uh, the fertilizing and possibly acidifying effect of air pollution. This map here tries to show you a bit about um, how much extra nitrogen, so this is the fertilizing effect generally, how much extra nitrogen our habitats are receiving. So each habitat has its own sensitivity, but in this case you'll see um, in the blue bits, so in the north of Scotland, those habitats hopefully are receiving the amount of nitrogen that won't interfere with their normal functioning. Um, but as you get into areas where there are more emission sources, you see habitats that are 10, uh, 10 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, so a couple of bags of sugar um, or more above their what's called critical load, so the amount of nitrogen depositing on the land that they can handle and function normally over time. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of red and black areas which are showing uh, quite high amounts of nitrogen deposition, and that's a lot of pressure from air pollution on our habitats. That's really what we're trying to say here. That will influence um, the types of decisions that are made and the types of data and tools that we require to, to do that. So we thought, okay, that's all well and good. We've got a map with, with too much nitrogen, but what does that actually mean for our ecosystems and how might we recognize that? So just a little bit of a reminder from previous talks. Lower plants that don't have true roots often react, especially to the concentration in the air of extra um, nitrogen or acidifying compounds or reactive nitrogen. So here's an example of a healthy lichen, and then it's made quite brittle and, and essentially the photosynthesizing parts that lichen in the, the lower left-hand corner no longer can work, so the lichen can't grow and it, it's being killed. Um, on the right-hand side, there's an example of a sphagnum moss, one that's, some people debate whether it's looking healthy or not, but it's got some healthy growth. And then it literally uh, does have its cells being, it, it melts essentially from really high ammonia. This happens uh, near big emission sources sometimes or, or in, in countries where the concentration is really high and um, it can happen more widespread. There are also effects on higher plants and our, our ecosystems more generally, but this is usually through um, an increase in grasses or, or species competition. So shading will occur because some of the plants get that are more tolerant to extra nitrogen they're taller and they block out 
the sun for things. In this example, velvet grass is able to block out the sun for wood sorrel. That makes it not able to compete. And you get a shift in the type of habitat that's present there. So it can take several years, but it also means that um, once you've had too much nitrogen in that habitat, it's very hard to get it back to the state you would hope. Um, the next talk will give you a lot more context about how these changes may or may not be affected by so many different things, not just air pollution as well. Um, one thing just to remind people about, animals uh, can be affected through their habitats as well. So the habitat they rely on for feeding, but also the habitat that they rely on for breeding. So some species are very selective about where they lay their eggs, etc. Um, acidification of fresh waters can also affect salmonids and, and other um, freshwater animals, such as the white clawed crayfish. But animals can also be a major source of some of the air pollution we recognize. So you get seabird colonies, but also bat colonies or big emitters of ammonia and contribute a, a significant enough amount to our air pollution inventories to mean that they've got their own category in there. So just one to be aware of. Um, that was quite a bit of a run through, but one thing to note is when you're thinking about air pollution and effects on the habitats and animals, there are a variety of pieces of data that we use. Uh, the sensitivity of the habitat I've referred to already, but also in our protected sites, what we're actually aiming for and whether air pollution might undermine that or affect it. Um, we'll look at air pollution information system, which talks about the background air quality. And some of our colleagues are working with data sets on that for the first time as well. Um, there's the kind of decision making aspects that each agency has to consider about whether they accept the amount of change from proposals. Um, management of the habitat will affect how you detect air pollution effects or whether they're actually going to undermine the site's ability to function and the quality of the habitat and the extent of the habitat those will hopefully be things that are more familiar in the JNCC work but also is air pollution affecting the future prospects for our habitats as well so <clears throat> all of those types of data are held in different places in the UK but also might have tools associated with them this also data and tools plug into our, our general sort of policy objectives. Uh, apologies to the other UK countries this, that I didn't use their symbols. I used some DEFRA symbols here, but they were, they're quite cross-cutting issues, whether that be us wanting to have more open data and data exchange, trying to streamline things, share data internationally, but also support our strategic work, whether that be for clean air or for ecosystems. Uh, and the types of action we have to take to reduce emissions more generally, whether that's in farming, industry, or just general development. Um, so just some examples of national data and tools and um, our indicators in JNCC are a big part of this as well, uh, because that's the digested national picture. Um, Air Pollution Information System is a key uh, website that we use. And there are also some data portals. Other data portals are available, by the way. So this is just an example, is the DEFRA's UK Air um, website, where there's a picture up there, and the Environmental Information Data Center that UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology run. Uh, biodiversity indicators are something that's quite critical for us in terms of trying to drive national change around air pollution effects on ecosystems. There's also a DEFRA annual critical load and level exceedance reports that has data and tools associated with it. And then we also have um, some national tools. This is available through APHIS uh, that help us to monitor some aspects. So in this case, this looks at nitrogen sensitive and nitrogen tolerant lichen. That data goes into a kind of national database that we're trying to get resource now to analyze. So it can be quite helpful data. So we're going to try something new in this webinar and switch to the browser. So does anybody want to volunteer a protected site for us to look at on APIS? Anybody have a favorite site that's not an offshore marine site? <laughs> <laughs> new forest. New forest. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
Did anybody else have one? Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except for Keith. <clears throat> Yeah, so we're on the air pollution information system, the URLs in the presentation. We've gone to the protected sites tab, so site relevant critical load. We'll go to the SAC. For every protected site in the UK at the moment, and we're talking to Republic of Ireland about trying to get this added on. Can everybody see it in here? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, there is a wealth of information available and we've done a lot of work. So this, this website's been available since 2003 um, and has evolved over time. It's meant to be easier to see on mobile devices because site officers are going out in the field and using that. If we look, we'll just look at one tab, but you get all the different pollutants um, here. Which feature would you like to look at, Bev? Can land, you see the inland, dunes, inland dunes? So they are ordered in sensitivity to that pollution. So the order might change on there. And we click on the little plus sign and it tells you how sensitive is nitrogen <laughs> and what the critical loads. So those numbers we were talking about that um, in this case are based on expert judgment, but sometimes it says they're quite reliable and that's based on field study data. Um, the UNIS class, so for those of you who have to match up different habitat types, it can be very interesting and then tries to give you a bit more understanding about how you use the critical load and then what you might expect to happen to that habitat. It also, which is quite an interesting feature and we're trying to, to look this up, it will give you the background pollution for the grid square that's there and in this case on the Brecklands for inland dunes. Here's the lower end and higher end of the critical load. And then the background pollution, is, is this site at risk or no, would you say? It's at risk, right? Okay. So the background pollution is much higher than what we expect the habitat to be able to operate at. And that will help people to decide whether to intervene there or not. This source attribution tab gets calculated in real time for these different pollutants and it tells you the kind of major sources that are contributing to that designated site. And so there's a table, here we see livestock, but also Europe imports. So a lot flowing over the channel towards the brooks. For those of you who like pictures, there are pie charts as well, but don't get hung up on the colors because they're ordered by the, the, major, the major number. So the colors change for the sources. That is air pollution information system for one protected site. Uh, there are also, you can look up habitat specific information if you don't want to look at a site, but you're curious about a specific species or a specific habitat or a pollutant and whether something's sensitive or not. There are also uh, tutorials in the quick links area. So starter's guide to air pollution and, and some of these other bits that might be of interest to folks. So that's kind of our national data. Thank you so much, guys. That works really well. We also have loads of tools that local authorities and regulators and applicants looking to permit air pollution sources near protected sites can use. APHIS is free and online. And then we have a kind of precautionary model that allows you to say, for my proposal, how much pollution might I deposit or having concentration near a habitat. That's free and online as well, um, and provided by the UK, well, regulators, developed administrations, and some conservation agencies, depending on who's got money at the time, in some respects. But then there are quite a few costly things also, so there's more detailed modeling that's undertaken by applicants at the moment, and then trying to account for all the small sources around something and decide if that's a big issue for a site. And um, this is a real, uh, a real challenge right now for the UK in trying to make decisions about whether to allow more pollution near our protected sites and something JNCC is trying to help explore um, how we can streamline that process a bit better so we can protect our habitats better and monitor their progress, et cetera. So I'm flagging that up. We've got, and we're trying to help DEFRA through the Nitrogen Futures Project that Alexander spoke about last week to help to maximize the emission reductions in the right places to protect our sites better. 
We also continue to work through the interagency air pollution group sharing our UK evidence, but we're looking at these kind of indicators of air pollution change as well. And as I was alluding to, maybe help figure out where emission sources are and how to align risk assessment. There's loads of cool work going on in JNCC, such as habitat mapping from Earth observation data, um, doing more ecosystem monitoring. So we've got some national plant monitoring scheme about that. And then also looking at where emission sources are. So some poor PhD students are identifying from Google Maps where they are. Um, and then also trying to, on APIS, instead of being text-based, having a map-based interface, we've also looked at that. So there's a few things on the horizon. If you have cool ideas you want to try to join up on, I'd really welcome hearing about it. Uh, yeah, so data and tools are really important for us, and JNCC are assisting UK agencies and DAs with this, but um, we like working with everybody. And uh, please visit APIS if you're interested. I think that's probably the gist of it. Ben <laughs> Kite and Andy Cross from EPR, Monday. So, ecological expertise evolved uh, is a strap line. You can really scribbling a strap line for me. Um, and they're going to talk to us about the confounded and the confounding and um, steering new forests. So, over to you, Ben. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us. <clears throat> so this, uh, our talk is about a piece of work that we were commissioned to do by New Forest District Council and the New Forest National Park Authority to um, uh, be part of the evidence base for their local plan. So they're looking at how many houses they should bring forward, where those houses should be. Obviously, um, most of the majority of that development is happening around the edge of the National Park, which is ecologically sensitive and important, and it's adding to um, pressure from the high development pressure areas on either side of the forest in South Hampshire and Dorset and Pool. So they wanted to know, in particular in relation to traffic related air pollution, um, what sort of evidence was there in the forest that um, the habitat's presence were already being affected and what might the local, what implications might the local plan development have for that so they can make some decisions about, about what they do. There are a great many sensitive habitats in the forest, um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, and um, we we've got, haven't got time to talk about all of them. Um, for example, there's an internationally important epiphytic lichen assemblage that uh, lives on, 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 on uh, old, old trees and in old woodlands. Um, they're probably the most sensitive feature, but we're going to talk to you today about the, the heathland habitats because um, we spent a lot of time working out how to, um, to, to try to go about detecting um, signals from air pollution damage in, in heathlands in the forest and to tell the difference between those and all the other factors that affect the composition of the vegetation. Just a little bit about the forest for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, it's one of the largest surviving tracts of unenclosed heathland in lowland England, although it has many other habitats um, present with, uh, as part of the, the mosaic. Um, importantly, it, it was created and then shaped by many centuries of human activity. So um, from prehistoric occupation, um, the clearance of, of woodland cover and forests since the Neolithic, um, the um, existence of commoners' rights since time immemorial. So there are things like the, the right of estovis to collect firewood, the right of turbury to cut turf, uh, the right of panish to put pigs out to eat acorns. There's grazing and there's all sorts of other things. And, and all of those play a part in influencing the way the habitats express themselves in the forest. It was declared a royal hunting forest in, in 1079. Um, by William the Conqueror, and really that's one of the reasons why it's still such a special place, because that has helped to preserve it as it is and keep it safe from modern agriculture uh, and, and the negative influences that, 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 that arise from that. Um, just as a, a, one point to note there is that um, in 2016, the marking fees paid on grazing animals in the forest show that there are at least 10,000 animals grazing out on the forest, common as animals. So this is a very significant influence on, on, on the habitats. Um, because of its ecological interest, it has multiple designations, um, some of them the European level, let's say C, SPA, some of them national, SSI, um, and obviously Ramsar is international as well. Um, just taking the SAC designation alone, for example, there are, th there are 13 habitat, uh, Annex 1 habitat types um, and, and three Annex 2 species on the, on the Natura 2000 data form for the SAC. So it's a, it's a very important and, and special place. What is the air pollution issue? Well, it's not reduced nitrogen, it's not fertiliser. Um, as a result of the almost total absence of modern agriculture inside the forest boundary, um, there's very low levels of prevailing um, ammonia and reduced forms of nitrogen. But air quality modelling shows that the busier roads that bisect the forest, that link to principal settlements, and in particular the A31 that cuts through the northern part of the forest, um, there's, a, there's a, an issue with oxidised forms of nitrogen associated with traffic 
potentially affecting habitats along those road corridors. And although the situation is predicted to improve, um, at, at the levels of air pollution are expected to improve in the future with uh, vehicle technology, etc. Um, the question is, is, um, is, is the additional traffic from local plan development with other local plans and surrounding areas going to slow that improvement to an extent that might make a difference to achieving the conservation objectives in that site. Past research by a lady called Penelope Angold in 1997 has linked some patterns of vegetation composition alongside the A31 in particular to air pollution. So we wanted to look at that. The particular pattern that was picked up is the one I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. It's the replacement of um, uh, heather-dominated heathland with um, more grass-rich habitats. Um, but there are a great many other things that do that. So my first job in conservation was as a heathland ranger. And you learn very quickly that when there was a fire on heathland, typically what happened is you'd have things like millennia grass coming up in the gap. And if that wasn't then grazed, then you sometimes ended up with um, a permanent grass from where once you had heathland. So there are all sorts of things that can affect vegetation composition. And, and oddly, um, although um, Angold picked up this particular pattern along the A31, um, it doesn't occur everywhere along the A31, which, which is strange, given, given that the road is busy for its entire length. Um, in some parts, um, the dominated heathland comes right at the carriageway, in other parts it's 200 metres back. So, so, so uh, what is going on there? And in other very minor forest roads that are well below their critical loads of pollution, sometimes you have very wide grass strips. So, so what is going on? And that's effectively the question that the uh, District Council and the Park Authority asked us, is what is happening? Um, can, can you work it out? So we designed a methodology to go about um, trying to test that. So just a, a little bit of background here. So um, the Critical uh, level for uh, ammonia for most vascular plants is three micrograms per meter cubed. For sensitive lichen to bryophytes, it's one. Um, everywhere you can see a black dot there, the background level in that five kilometer grid square, according to APIS, is below the one microgram um, crit critical level. And um, red is where it's exceeded. So you can see that it's that the modern agriculture around the edge of the forest is where most of the reduced nitrogen is coming from. <coughs> Inside the forest, you've got a very low ammonia environment. But then this is the issue. So this is the where the uh, critical level for NOx, the 30, 30 micrograms per meter cubed uh, level is exceeded. This is the A31 that cuts across the northern part of the forest, linking the high development pressure areas of South Hampshire with places, places like Poole and Dorset, where there's equally large amounts of, of development happening. So we wanted to go out and look and try and find if we could see signals of air pollution damage along the A31 that we could link clearly to air pollution that, that, that perhaps weren't um, occurring elsewhere. Or, or, or find ways of testing um, what we can see in the vegetation against other variables to see what, what is mostly explaining what we're seeing on the ground. Just a couple of pictures to show you. So this is on the A31, the busiest road in the forest near Pickett Post, and you've got heather-dominated heathland right way up to the carriageway. I know there are other patterns here, so you've got this sort of um, a pony path along the edge of the grazing fence there. But this is um, the B3056 near Beaulieu Road Station in the southeast corner of the forest. This is a very quiet forest road, well below its critical loads, and you've got this huge grass strip existing there, which is, which is strange. Um, but all sorts of things that might be influencing that, which we'll talk about in a bit, but you know, for example, um, in the run-up to World War II, this area was used for storing tanks. They were, they were parked up there ready to, to go over to the continent. Could that kind of disturbance be having, a, having an effect here? This is the sort of thing that we're, we, we were looking at in our, in our study. This is um, just another, another fairly minor forest road, so um, uh, B3078, just to the north of the A31 in, in the forest. Um, this was looked at by a uh, local expert, Neil Sanderson, um, who, who we, we've done quite a lot of work with in the past, and that you get a similar zonation pattern along the roads, but it, but it varies according to, according to all sorts of factors. So the zone one here, you've got a species-rich acid grassland, and it's quite important to note that it's species-rich, and it contains, um, these sorts of areas can contain species of conservation importance, so things like wild chamomile, for example, less butterfly orchid. So you've got to be very careful before you just dismiss that as damage because there's, there's a lot of interest there. So we, we, it, we, um, we need to understand it before we decide that it's due to damage and try to do something about it. At the next zone there, um, so this is sort of, you, you get ephemeral pond communities in the wet ditch and that drains off where you can see the runoff where the blue arrows are. Um, the area in the middle is a, a, an acidic, a drier acid grassland, and then you've got the, the heathland proper in zone three. And, and variations of this theme occur all, all through the forest. So this is where I'm going to do, introduce Andrew Cross. He's EPR's lead botanist, 
and he effectively designed the method that we came up with to test all the different influences that might be affecting vegetation and try to decide which ones most explain what you can see along the A31. But it's also probably important to note that we were given two months to come up with this methodology and implement it. So we had to throw our whole team into it. Um, so I'm sure that given time, uh, there's a way to iterate the methodology and improve it and, and get better information out of the data. But I'll hand you over to Andy at that point. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ben. Uh, just before I start this talk, I would like to um, acknowledge the, the, the great deal of help I had from Neil Sanderson, a local expert who a massive amount of experience in the new forest, its vegetation pattern cycles and things like that. Uh, but any mistakes that I make in this are, are my own and nothing to do with Neil. Uh, this map here shows the um, models nutrient nitrogen deposition um, in, in the new forest landscape for 2015, and it was provided to us by another consultancy air quality consultants um, to help us with our work. The area of interest that I uh, looked at is in this block here, this is the A31. Uh, the black lines are the, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the black line, the small black lines are the 200 meter uh, zone around the edges of roads. And that's the recognized uh, potential impact zone that the um, uh, highways agency, for example, would want you to have a look at to see if you can pick up any, any changes. Um, Sorry, I've got these slides the, uh, the wrong way around. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this curve here is from um, uh, the air quality consultants, um, and it just shows how concentrations in, um, in pollutants adjacent to a road fall off. So we have a very, very steep fall off um, quite close to the road, and by the time you're getting to 100 metres away from the road, you're getting very, very close to background levels. Um, uh, so I decided to sample um, the um, uh, vegetation at, at fixed points on a, on a transect perpendicular to the road and I chose to do it at fixed intervals 25, 50, 75, 100 and 200. Um, the red line here I couldn't get any close you might wonder why I couldn't get any closer to the road into where the concentrations are extremely high um, but there are many problems associated with working very close to the road so for example I put this band in here at 10 meters and that more or less reflects the average distance away from the road. You get a fence, often a ditch, and uh, there's massive amounts of um, uh, work that's gone on in that in that particular buffer zone. It's also unbraced and completely atypical. Um, I'm going to come back to this this 15 meters. You think, well, why why didn't I get closer to here? But there's an awful lot of landscape history associated with this road, and that has had a significant impact. And I wanted to try and avoid that as best as I can, as best I could. So 25 meters from the road edge was as close as I dared go. Um, I did get these slides out of sequence, so I'm just going to go back one. So what patterns did I expect, or was I hoping to see, or even um, trying to find out there? And uh, that first pattern of the curve and the concentrations falling off perpendicular to the road. Um, so the highest concentrations near the road. We've spoken about um, uh, in a heathland landscape, which is what this is. Where uh, he, uh, uh, heather, if you like, is 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 uh, replaced by by grass. So my pattern in my mind's eye was that I find um, grassy habitats nearer the road and the further I got away, the less grassy and the more heathery they were. The second pattern um, is that um, for one of those given transect, uh, those sample points I mentioned, for example, at 25 meters, um, because the concentrations coming off the road are the same the whole length of the road. One imagines that at 25 meters, it's going to be each sample should be the same. It's getting the same level of pollution. So there's a, a pattern that's parallel to the road. So 25 meters all the way along the road, they should be all grassy. And then all of the 50 meter um, samples should be less grassy. So th those are the two patterns I wanted to try and see if I could find there. And um, this is the landscape I worked in. Um, very, very complicated landscape. And I had to um, try and um, reduce uh, variables in there. So I was fortunate that there was a, there's a plateau that this road travels across. So that took away slope, which is very important. And it's the same geology. We're on a, a gravel terrace here, and it was uniform for my whole sampling area. So mercifully, I had um, those um, taken out of my equation to a, to a large extent. So I came up with a, um, or I, the team came up with the idea of, of, um, of, of transects. Um, and this is the pattern in the end that I uh, that, that I came up with: 15 on the southern side of the road on the plateau, and 15 on the 
north side of the road on the plateau. They are spaced out so I could get as much um, as much range as I could. And these are randomly located, um, but they avoid particularly obvious um, problems associated with road edges. Um, what I collected in my sample points here, uh, I, I worked on a one, one meter by one meter photograph. I recorded all the vegetation in there, vascular plants, firefights and lichens. Uh, I recorded percentage cover, uh, height and stage of Kaluna, but I'm, I'm not going to discuss the results from those here today. <clears throat> the vegetation types that are adjacent to the road on the plateau are these. If, if, if you do your NBC, um, I haven't unfortunately put any, any sort of um, English variants of the names, but um, H3A is essentially bristlebent heath. It's a southwestern community um, and it's very characteristic in the forest on, on damper, uh, damper soils. Um, H3C, this is particularly important in this area because this is, um, um, if you like, the, 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 the typical sub-community, but if you disturb it, um, the gorse comes in and that brings in a sort of beautifying effect and um, it does lead to um, uh, an increase in grass cover associated with the disturbance and the gorse. Um, the other two communities of note in my study area were the bristlebent grassland, which is actually really quite quite uncommon in the end, and then where disturbance was so severe that um, the, uh, the ground could parch, then you get a, a different acid grassland community here, which I call the, the parched acid grassland community. So those are the vegetation types in my landscape. It's important um, to realize that um, these are, I mean, this is a sort of static uh, list, but uh, if you read your um, NBC and um, uh, typically you know, volume two or volume three as well, when this vegetation, the seasonal vegetation is managed, you'll see cycling of, um, uh, that goes through a cycle of, um, for example, burning, reduces the heather cover, the grasses flourish, but the heather eventually reasserts itself, the grass cover diminishes. So there's a, there's a well-described cycle for this community. Landscape history is, uh, was, a, was a very, very important feature in shaping um, how I could sample this landscape. So I've, um, I've um, um, got this old, old map here. This is the Ordnance Survey drawing for the, the New Forest, and it dates to about um, uh, 1801, 1805, that kind of era. And it's drawn at two inches to the mile, very, very, very well surveyed by uh, military surveyors. And um, this is the uh, what's going to become the A31, and that's how it looked in the um, uh, in 1801. So there's a there is a sort of formal road. Up. I don't know too much about the history of it. It may have been a turnpike. Turnpike. I, I don't know. Um, but if you see here, there's just we'll, we'll come to this on the next slide. There's a, um, a tumulus mentioned there, a little bar burial ground, and um, but it's it's the main road across the forest. There are no other roads in this area or this area. So so, so this, this road uh, going from Stony Cross all the way through, it, it has been a principal um, route through this landscape for a long, long time. And whilst it looks like there's a lane on there, which may have been used by large carriages and carts, lots and lots of animals would have been um, traversing that landscape adjacent to that road and parallel to it. So there's, 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 there's likely to be, uh, well, there is a lot of, of um, unmarked rutting and um, um, transportation tracks and animal tracks of different shapes and sizes. Along that along that road, and that has um, that that has had very very long lasting <coughs> effects on the vegetation. Um, this is a this is a uh, this is a um, the A31 um, showing um, a sort of summary of the landscape history influences on on the landscape. So I some of my transects are out in this uh, in this landscape, but the um, the barrow the tumulus I mentioned is is is, is here, and um, but the this zone here is full of the old rutting that must have taken place over eons as this um, route was used through this landscape and you can go you can go here you can see all of this rutting and of course that's meant that you have this disturbed um, bristlebent heath community the h3c i was talking about which um, um, is very very different to the undisturbed soils community out here um, this line here represents the fact that i could measure the width of the, the gorse zone on a very accurate map from the 1870s and it shows that it's a very very persistent feature in this landscape um, hundreds of years old, the effects. Um, I didn't sample in here, even though this looks like a potentially very interesting zone where there's been some impact from air quality, very, very grassy. Um, but this is, a, this is a much later impact where the original um, A31, before it was jeweled, comes along here. Most of it's buried under this, but this is actually where the old A31 itself um, peaks out from 
the side of the road. And that A31 has got a, a calcium rich substrate which is feeding out into the adjacent land. So all of this grassland here is, is almost certainly to do with the, uh, um, the uh, enrichment from the substrate of the, of the, of the, of the old A31. So um, I, I, I didn't sample that zone at all. I think I started somewhere, somewhere down here. Um, there's vast amounts of management take place. So we think of these heathlands sometimes as, as, um, uh, uh, as semi-natural, um, undisturbed habitats, but um, pretty well for all of the samples that I chose, um, uh, I got this information from the Forestry Commission, and we can see that um, um, all of them have had at least one form of management in the last 20 years, and sometimes multiple types of management. Um, we've also got um, burning taking place in there, cutting and baling, um, and wildfires as well. So what superficially looks like a, um, um, a relatively undisturbed heathland is actually managed quite intensively. Um, and, um, uh, and, and of course, on top of all of that, we have grazing. And Ben mentioned the numbers of animals that are present in the forest. Uh, they, uh, they, they will, they, 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 they uh, there seem to be two types of grazing here. So if, we, if you manage a, a plot and there, like you burn it, There'll be a flush of grasses. This takes place all over the forest, not just against the road. Uh, the ponies, cattle, or whatever will come in, graze it for a short while, but eventually the, the, the heather reasserts itself and the, the grasses diminish and uh, the grazing moves on. So there's like a sort of temporary, if you like, um, grazing phase. But in that gallstone I was telling you about near the road, where um, it's slightly enriched from uh, disturbance and gorse and things like that, that's more or less a permanent pasture. And they're on there a lot more. Uh, a, a lot more, and these animals, of course, are bringing in. Um, they're, they're urinating there, so they're bringing a lot of phosphorus into this landscape, and um, and and, and, and dunging in there as well. But of course, they are also removing nutrients on the whole when they when, as they're moving around the landscape. So here are some results. Um, just very briefly, I um, I looked at all of the uh, 30, uh, 30, um, 30 transects, and 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 for each distance, plotted out the. Um, um, the, 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 the average cover here of bristle bent, and this you know looks like there is an air quality signal, but uh, the reality is that almost all of this zone is in that um, disturbed area, and the, the, the relative abundance of Cotisei, uh, sorry, bristle bent here is, 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 is related to that and, and, and not necessarily an air quality signal. Um, we, can, we, we look at the, um, the, the, the cover of, uh, of Kaluna, for example. Um, this shows, you'd imagine that Kaluna would be very low, closer to the road, and then building up some distance away. So um, this pattern here within the, the sort of intensively managed zone does not reflect that at all. And um, this area here, uh, at 200 metres in where the um, we're in background levels, I mean, that, that really is, has very, very limited management. Um, so it tends to be old and senescent, senescent heath. Um, that was looking at the averages. If you actually look at um, uh, as here, uh, bristle bent, every single sample along um, all the 30 samples along at 25 meters away from the road, you imagine that they should be a constant um, grass cover because they, they're all getting the same amount of uh, nutrient nitrogen that's being deposited from the road. So I expected to see um, a fairly uniform cover of, of, of bristle bent along the 25 uh, meter uh, zone, but we can see here that it just ranges from them being completely absent to 90% and, and everything in between. So this doesn't, this suggests to me that there's not um, a strong association with nutrient nitrogen deposition from the road. And, um, and the, same, uh, the same applies to the um, um, Heather Kaluna. It, it shows this equally sort of random um, amount of cover from, from the road. So it's not as though that the, the, the air quality, the air pollutants at that 25 meter band are driving the cover. Of um, Heather is much more likely to be associated with um, the management. Um, here's, here's something slightly, here's, here's another grass um, looking at the, the, the average of the mean cover um, at these different sample points along here. We can actually see that millennia is increasing the further away you get from the road. It's increasing <coughs> as the concentration, as the nitrogen, nutrient nitrogen deposition is, is diminishing. So that, that doesn't really kind of tally with what one might expect from um, a nutrient nitrogen uh, deposition. Um, species richness, um, I, I can see that we're short of time, I'm gonna skip over that. I looked at the, all the quadrats that I did, 
and tried to find out, uh, we analyzed them with the Ellenberg values. We'd imagine that you know higher nitrogen would be up here and then it would be falling off to lower nitrogen values over here for the quadrats, um, but it seems to be the same all across. So we can't, with the Ellenberg values, we're not picking up a, a nutrient nitrogen um, signal there. So there's quite a lot of sort of um, unexpected information coming out of our work, but it doesn't seem that there's a very strong and obvious signal um, coming from nutrient nitrogen deposition here, and there are multiple other factors that could be explaining what's going on, including landscape history, the different forms of management, and grazing, almost certainly overwhelming whatever signals are coming from air quality. Ben, thank you. So, um, just just to finish off, um, I just wanted to take us quickly back to the Habitats Directive and what it asks us to, to achieve and to do. Uh, and it, it, it says in Article 1 that conservation means to maintain and restore a favourable status. And a conservation status means some of the influence is acting on that natural habitat. Uh, and that then through managing natural 2000 is then translated into site specific conservation objectives. Uh, and then the concept of site integrity is linked to that um, when we talk about Article 6.3 and the way in which one considers new projects. Now, it, it seems to be, um, as, as, as from, our, from our results, that looking at the sum of influences here, that management is, is either concealing any signals from air pollution or is in fact counteracting it. And that, that those sorts of relationships must exist because if you're adding a certain amount of nitrogen from air pollution, um, activities such as burning and grazing will be removing a certain amount of nitrogen from the habitat as well. Um, so I think one of the things that sort of this work told us is that the, getting the management right for a site does does provide a protective effect. And if you look at what the, the approach taken in, in Holland, um, I'm, Actually, with <coughs> recent high-profile coverage with, with the, um, the recent legal cases, um, but, but part of their twin-track approach was to look at ecological restoration, getting um, those sort of functioning um, systems going again by re-wetting wetlands, by getting grazing and the right management. And I think that's a, something that we, we, we should be aiming for. We should be looking at all of our um, high-level protected sites and asking, are they getting the right management? Um, so, um, just to, just to, to summarise and tie off, our, our results suggested that um, vegetation composition um, and, and the changes in it, the patterns in it, were more strongly correlated to factors such as management um, than to air pollution, as far as we could tell. Landscape history exerted a quite strong influence on the results. Um, but the caveat to that is that um, the relationship between the variables are very complex. So, management is more intense next to the road, um, which means that um, it's quite hard to tease apart effects from management to air, quality, air pollution because air pollution is also stronger closer to the road. And when you have recent burning, for example, you also get higher grazing pressure because you have fresh flushes of young grass that bring in the grazing animals and they let dung and release phosphorus into that environment. So teasing these things apart is incredibly complicated and difficult to do. Um, again, coming back to the sum of influence, we've got to sort of consider really whether or not um, impacts are significant on different sites uh, and where we've got the right management in place I think we can try and make this habitat more resistant so that the sum of the influences is, is, in, is in favour of um, promoting the conservation objectives of, of that site. Um, the Habitat Directive talks about trying to achieve, this is the final thought for the day, um, the minimum of external management support for Natural 2000 sites in order, to, in order to enable them to be in a good condition and what the minimum of external management support is is really confusing for a site that is essentially anthropogenic, um, created by human activity, maintained by human activity. So um, our, our view is, is that um, you would be going beyond the minimum of external management support if you had to intensify the management in order to bring the site back into good condition. If, it, if in actual fact it's being managed according to what's right for the site, in this case of the forest, the normal exercise of commoners' rights, then we're not going beyond that minimum of external management support. And I think that's I think that's all we have to say. Um, I hope we haven't taken them too long. We haven't at all. No. Um, thank you so much. Uh, to